My brothers and sisters, it's important for us to look at Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam as the ideal role model. He is the only creature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or human being whom we can look at from every aspect of his life and say he's a role model. When it comes to the rest of us, we only take part of what the person may have succeeded in and consider them role models in that particular part alone. Let me give you an example. A person who excels at university, for example, they would be role models for those who want to excel at university, even though that person may not be a good Muslim. You hear my point? We don't take the part from them that they miss their salah or they may not be Muslim at all. We have Steve Jobs. He's a role model for a lot of people in what? That's the question. Just in one aspect of his life. We have, for example, some of your lecturers who might be brilliant people, really dedicated, selfless people. They are your role models in what? In that particular aspect. You have, for example, a reciter of the Quran, powerful, reads beautiful. He's got everything it needs to be able to render an eloquent, beautiful, heart-wrenching recitation. He is a role model in what? In reciting the Quran and so on and so forth. You have someone who's got a lot of knowledge of the deen. They are role models in what? In that particular aspect. I hope you get what I'm saying. Similarly, you have, say, an athlete, a trainer in the gym, whoever else it is, role models. We want to be like them in what? In a little aspect of their lives. But Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, no aspect of his life is not or no aspect of his life is not upon the highest level. It is all upon a level that is not only worth us following, but it is considered an act of worship for us to follow. So this evening, seeing that we're speaking here at this beautiful university, UCT University of Cape Town, Alhamdulillah, I would like to go through one aspect of the life of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I want it to be a means of inspiration for us all, myself included. It is called waiting for the turning point in others. What does that mean? It's something amazing. Waiting for the turning point in others is part of the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, in his case, it was waiting for the turning point in others. In our case, because we are not prophets of Allah, it is a turning point within us as well. And for that, we should not be waiting. But for others, we are patient. We should continue. We should be dedicated. We should have hope. We should pray for them. That's the sunnah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What did he do when he saw Abu Jahl? Abu Jahl was the biggest enemy of Islam. He continued making dua for him. He continued trying with him. He was kind to him. Although Abu Jahl was cruel to him, he continued having hope. He continued in so many good things regarding Abu Jahl. And he always felt that definitely this man is going to come if Allah wills to the deen. So much so the time when Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, who was much younger than the Prophet sallallahu alayhi 13 years younger than the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he was a strong man, feared, loud, intolerant. The Prophet ﷺ used to make dua for him as well as Abu Jahl in the same sentence. He has said, Allahumma a'izz al-Islam bi ahad al Before I translate that, let me tell you something. When you see a person who's powerful in authority, who's got a lot of clout and they're not Muslim or they're using their energy in a destructive way and you keep on having hope that you know if this energy can be used in the right direction it will definitely do a great service to islam and the muslimin this person has potential we're not looking at the evil that's coming from them we're looking at the potential the strength the dedication with which they're using these energies in a wrong way and we are saying if it can be channeled in the correct way Subhanallah, it would be amazing because this person effortlessly goes and makes people's lives difficult. Imagine if they had to be effortlessly going to make people's lives easy, how brilliant it would be. That is heavenly. That is prophetic. It's amazing. He had hope and he kept on saying, Oh Allah, and this is the translation of that dua, grant strength to Islam through the acceptance of Islam of one of the two Umars. 
One was known as Amr ibn Hisham, that was the proper name of Abu Jahal. And one was Umar ibn al-Khattab, the man we know, radiallahu anh, later to be known as. So he kept making this dua and he kept asking and he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, do you know why? He was waiting for the turning point in them, waiting for it. He knew it would come when Allah wills, if Allah wills. But for him, he knows his duty was to convey the message, to keep on being kind, be the best person, continue having hope. They will come one day. And they came. One of them came, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. And the day he came, there was strength granted to Islam. The man used his energy. He used his reputation in society. He used the authority that he had to a certain extent in the right direction. Because he says, as soon as he accepted Islam, alasna ala al-haq, are we not on the straight path? And the Prophet sallallahu says, yes, we are. Indeed, we are. Why should we fear people? Let's fulfill salah in public. Let's engage in our prayer in public. Why should, be we, why should we be worried about these people of Quraysh who, that they may harm us, they may do this, they may do that. They can do nothing. I am there. Allah is there. So they had these two rows of people. One was led by Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib and the other was led by Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu. They marched in full view of the people of Quraysh to the Haram, to Mecca. For the first time, they read Salah in congregation. At that time, Salah was not yet compulsory. It was still a voluntary act of worship. And they went forth and they engaged in Salah. The Salah that was given in Mi'raj was that Salah which was now compulsory. And that's when it became five times, five times a day. That is later on. But earlier, it was voluntary. It was only two units and it was voluntary. So they got to the Kaaba, they got to the front and they read Salah openly. They read Salah clearly. They used to face Jerusalem at the time. It's something unique. But the point being raised is Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu was really a man whom Allah used in order to strengthen the deen. And from this, it teaches us never lose hope in people. Never ever. No matter who they are, your children, your friends, the drunkard, the one in the clubs, the one on drugs, the one who has the worst qualities. Keep on praying, keep on trying, keep on having hope, keep on being kind, and keep on explaining the truth, continuing to explain the truth in a beautiful manner. You don't need to become harsh. You don't need to become hard. Because Allah says in the Quran, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَلِيظَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْفَضُّوا مِنْ حَوْلِكَ It is because of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you were lenient with them or upon them. You were kind to them. You were soft with them. Allah says that is the mercy of Allah. When you're soft with people, when you're kind to them, when you're lenient with them, it's a sign of the mercy of Allah upon you. And Allah says, if you were hard-hearted, if you were harsh and hard-hearted, they would have dispersed from around you. They wouldn't have listened to you. You have people who don't want to hear a message of doom. They want to be told, you know, with a pat on the back, don't worry, you're doing well, but you can do better. It's a way of speaking. Don't worry, you're doing well. Each one of us has a struggle. We are all trying. I said it this morning at another university. And to be honest, I live by it. I know there are struggles, myself included. We are all struggling to earn the pleasure of Allah and to improve no matter what level I am upon or you are upon. Every one of us knows we are trying to become better people as the days pass. So much so that if I were to ask you today, how many of you read five salah a day? I'm sure I would see most of the hands, I hope. And if I were to ask you how many of us read salah to tahajjud, for example, I would see slightly less hands. But in your heart, you know, I want to get there someday. And by the mercy of Allah, he sometimes inflicts you with something that makes you get up for tahajjud. Do you know why? He just wants you to taste the sweetness of it. How many of us have had a difficulty that led us to this late night prayer, early morning prayer, in a way that we tasted its sweetness, even after the problem was gone, we still get up once in a while and we love pleasing Allah in that way. The prayer that no one's watching, that's a gift of Allah. So we all have our struggles, the sisters perhaps, with all the peer pressure, perhaps the environmental pressure, 
in whatever way it is. You know, everything that's happening around us, the environment. Sometimes it's difficult even to dress appropriately. You know your struggles. And therefore, you know that you'd like to improve this and you'd like to improve that. And perhaps I, I believe firmly that every one of us improves as time passes. And wherever we falter and drop, we turn back to Allah. Imagine someone coming to you and say, you know what? You're not worth it. You're still going to hell. That's it. Can you feel it burning? Allah forgive us. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, waited patiently. He kept on dedicatedly reminding the people to say, hang on, this is the path. This is Allah. This is the way. And he did not lose hope. And he continued the same message over and over again in different words. If you look at the reminder of Salah, how many times does it appear in the Quran? Anyone knows? Where Allah says, establish your Salah. We all know it's more than once. It's more than twice. It's quite a few times. The reason is Allah is telling you, hang on, there are so many different times and places in the Quran and wordings because one of them may affect you. As you're reading the Quran, we are taught to read it from cover to cover. Say, for example, and this is something unique to also taught by Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The hearts of the people are not the same every day and they fluctuate and change. So grab that heart when it's at a point where it is going to absorb what's coming in the direction of it in terms of spirituality in order to give it a good message so i give you an example you're busy reading the quran at the beginning of ramadan and mashallah you're excited and so on and you're reading the meaning of it and allah tells you to establish your salah establish your prayer and it didn't really hit you that much because as it is you're reading taraweeh and you're going on and on and on and then when it comes to the second half of ramadan you start softening up a bit because you know with us the month of ramadan you climax at the end right at the beginning everything is still okay i've got 29 days 28 days to go hey there's only six days to go let's get serious that's how ramadan is it's unique it's you know it's like a long race long race a marathon near the end everyone becomes more serious to say now we've got to win alhamdulillah not to say we weren't running at the beginning but to be honest as time passes you read it again there may come a time of the day that will be different there may come something that's happened in your day that particular day that has made you think from a different angle something that might have happened in your life that makes you feel this is the time for me to change this is the time for me to turn and then you turn and you only turned because that message was repeated in a different wording at a different time but it was the same message subhanallah if you ask yourself you know these Imams who come to talk to us, these scholars who come to talk to us, perhaps the halaqat that we have that are a reminder for us. If you ask yourself, what is the message? To be honest, it's always the same message. Always. It's telling you to get closer to Allah, to be, become a better person, to improve yourself, to worry about what's to come after death and so on. All of the messages are the same, but the way they're worded, different. The timings, different. I believe that there are certain times of the day when people are more receptive to religious instruction, perhaps. I believe perhaps like at this time here, the evening, early evening, it's a very blessed time. Early morning, very blessed time. You know, the early hours of the morning, subhanallah, you and Allah, imagine reading a book, listening to a talk, and suddenly it strikes a chord, as they say, you changed. The same way you can change, have hope in the rest of the people, the rest of them. Everybody can change. That is the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa He always had hope. Let me give you another example. A companion we spoke about this morning by the name of Khalid ibn al-Walid ibn al-Mughira, radiyallahu anhu, powerful man. I'm sure we've heard his name, okay? After the battle of Uhud and after the treaty of Hudaybiyah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa called his brother, who was already a Muslim and he was already in Medina and said, where is Khalid? Imagine, the man is gone. He's in Mecca. The man is not even in Medina. The man just fought us. The man is part of the enemy. But the Prophet, peace be upon him, is calling his brother, says, where is Khalid? So the brother is answering to say, okay, you know, a simple answer. The Prophet وسلم, says, Ma mithlu Khalidin Islam. He says, a man like Khalid, so intelligent so bright he's got such a mind he is an expert he's got a top brain he cannot be ignorant of the correctness of islam that's all he said the prophet peace be upon him is saying this man 
no matter what he's done, he didn't harp on the fact that, you know, in Uhud, there were 70 people martyred. And in, this is what happened in the other war. And Khalid did this and nothing of that nature. He's a leader. He has hope. He's waiting for the turning point. That's a sunnah. That's part of the seerah. And it is consistent throughout the life of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Absolutely all the time, right up to the end, he had hope including his uncle Abu Talib, who was a man who did not accept the faith. But the Prophet, peace be upon him, on the deathbed of this man, Abu Talib, he goes to him and says, Oh, my uncle, utter one statement, and I will fight your case on the day of judgment. What was that? Hope, waiting for a turning point. Hoping for a turning point, even at the last moment. That's a sunnah. So, Khalid ibn al-Walid, the Prophet, peace be upon him, says, He will not be ignorant of it because he has such a top brain. He will, be, will definitely be thinking about it. In the meantime, Allah alone knows what's happening to Khalid ibn al-Walid. He's considering. He says, no. These people are so dedicated. They're so kind. Yes, we fought them. Yes, I have the wrong perception of who they are. That's what's happening today on the globe as well. A lot of people don't know much about Islam. A lot of people look at it with skepticism because what do they hear? Exactly what Khalid ibn al-Walid ibn al-Mughira radiallahu anhu heard before Islam. He actually went out to fight the Muslims. And what happened? Because of the hope, because of the goodness, because of the kindness, because of the character and the conduct of the rest of the Muslimin and so on. He continued, meaning he started thinking about Islam. No way. This is a religion. It's a faith. But he had one problem. What was the problem? I've killed people. I've committed sin. I've committed so much. I've harmed. I've done. I don't think I'm going to be forgiven. It took him a bit of a while. He built the courage to come to Medina Munawwara. And when he came in, the Prophet, peace be upon him, knew what was happening. He knew. He had a feeling this man is coming in. He's going to declare his faith. But Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu did not declare his faith immediately. He had a question. He had a question to ask. What was the question? O oh, Messenger, I've done so much. What's going to happen to that? I've committed sin. You know what I did in Uhud and so on. The details. He says, what's going to happen to that? And the Prophet ﷺ says, Ya Khalid, innal Islam ya jubbu ma qabla. O oh, Khalid, Islam, the fact that you are entering the fold will delete all the bad that you've done in the past. Guess what? The good is carried through. Subhanallah. The bad and the evil is deleted, wiped out gone subhanallah he says he asked the question again he got the same answer he asked the question a third time he got the same answer then he stretches his hand he says on that condition i bear witness you are indeed the messenger of allah none worthy of worship besides allah and you are the messenger of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam this was how khalid ibn al-walid entered the fold of islam look at the beauty look at the goodness but did the prophet peace be upon him say no that's an enemy Allah allah's curse on him he's 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 a right off he's it's over we do that with muslims we do that with muslims this person is like this that one is like that this one is a goner what are you talking about it just depicts the condition of our own hearts and this is why i say be patient Wait for the turning point in others. And as for yourself, ask yourself, am I going to live to see the next morning? Why should I wait to turn myself? So when it comes to others, we are lenient. When it comes to ourselves, we should not be lenient. Turn now. Be hard on yourself. Don't be hard on others. You ask yourself, why am I not fulfilling my daily prayers? Why am I not dressing appropriately? Why do I not worship Allah alone? Why do I have weaknesses of superstitious beliefs and so on? Why, why am I engaging in this? Ask yourself those hard hitting questions. But when it comes to others, guide them slowly. They will come at their pace. If Allah wills. And if you take a look at the other companions of Rasulullah the same applied. Let's take a step further from Khalid ibn al-Walid. What was the next step? They had the victory of Mecca. Abu Sufyan, who was the leader of the Meccans, he was one of the one of the enemies of Islam, who was the leader of the armies, some of the armies that fought the Muslimin. And the victory of Mecca, when the Muslimin were marching onto Mecca with their power, their might, their numbers. They would have wiped out anything in their path. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, says, Anyone who enters the house of Abu Sufyan is safe. Do not harm anyone who doesn't hold a weapon. 
Do not harm the women and the children and the elderly. Do not harm the one who doesn't want to fight you. Do not harm the one who's gone into the places of worship. Take a look at what the Muslimin are doing today in the name of Islam. Places of worship. Astaghfirullah. They're harming people in the places of worship. Not only non-Muslim, but Muslimin. This message was about non-Muslims. Non-Muslims in their places of worship. No matter who and what they are worshipping. The fact that they are in their places of worship, they are not supposed to be harmed by the lip of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, whoever enters their place of worship is supposed to be safe. What are we doing? Take a look at how we've become so hard hearted. We've turned away from the basic teachings of Islam. I'm not talking about us seated here perhaps. But I'm talking about some activity that is happening in the name of Islam. Not in my name, not in yours, not in the name of Islam. That is incorrect. It's wrong. So when people talk about following the example of Muhammad sallallahu the problem we have is a lot of people think that it's only connected to one aspect or two aspects. What about all this? What about what I've said today? Did you know that when we talk of the seerah and the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu Every aspect of your life is connected to it. Every single aspect, whatever you've done, your salah, your walking, your talking, your cleanliness, what we could be speaking about the tahara and cleanliness and how to wash and how to bathe. And that would be the seerah of Muhammad sallallahu and his sunnah. It would be because it's part and parcel of it. It's unique. It's amazing. But I believe that sometimes because of our weakness, we pick and choose and then we label others. And then we look at others and start believing that we are better Muslimin than them. And this is where we falter. Let's keep on trying. Let's keep on having hope. But my brothers and sisters, there is always a turning point in our lives. Allah does not leave a single human being without direct reminders to him or her in his or her life. It's not possible. The minute you arrive at the age of puberty, it's your duty to find Allah. It's your duty to look for him and he will reach out to you because he says clearly Man atani yamshi harwala. There is a beautiful hadith where he says whoever comes to me a handspan I come to him a foot whoever comes to me walking I come to him rushing It's impossible for you to look for your maker and he's not looking for you You look for him a little bit he'll reach out to you But those signs need to be translated and interpreted in the correct sense Sometimes it's in the form of a calamity Sometimes it's in the form of prayers being answered. You know how it feels when you hear at the university and you've just written the most important examinations and you're praying. What happens? You become a good Muslim for a little while, don't you? MashaAllah. Yes, it is. Oh Allah, I promise you. I promise you. Ya Allah. Ya Allah. And then you know, you see your boyfriend after a while. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> Allah forgive us. It happens, doesn't it? Because why? I need to pass my exams. The minute you see your results, hey, and you're back again. Allahu Akbar. May Allah forgive us. This is reality striking. That was Allah reaching out to you. Allah says, you called out to me. Here, I gave, I gave it to you. What happened? You appreciate, you thank Allah. You know, like we say, you can have a guy in your life, but you just need to regularize it. That's all. See, those who've understood what it means. It's not an easy task. You can have a guy, you know, you can have the woman of your dreams. You need to regularize it. It reminds me of a guy who came to invite everyone with a little card to say, I'm getting married, I'm getting married. I'm getting married to who? Hey, to the king's daughter, like the princess. Oh, you getting, you getting married to the princess? And he used to just clean the streets. Yes, I am. How, how did you do it? He says, no, it's almost done. 50% confirmed. <laughs> how 50%? Well, I'm extremely happy. I'm just waiting for them to accept. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. May Allah help us. May Allah guide us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. But the point I'm raising is Allah creates things in our life. Sometimes you fail after you were calling out to Allah because Allah wants you to do better. Wallahi, sometimes failure makes you a person who is much better in character. Do you know that you have people sometimes who develop an arrogance because they pass just like this. They develop an arrogance. They become people who think, hey, you know, that's it. It's me. Thank you, fans. Thank you all. You know, <laughs> to be honest with you, Allah will wake you up one day to say, you know what? You're just one human being. You're going to return to me. 
these degrees are all temporary they will help you for a few years what's going to help you for the entire life after death is your relationship with me we're not saying don't become whatever you want to become become but understand that will only help you when you serve Allah through your field over and above serving Allah through what he has made obligatory upon you so how I start as a Muslim if I want to follow Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam I will start off with my obligations I'll be a good Muslim I'll try my best to fulfill my salah to dress appropriately my social relations need to be pure and clean and so on I need to treat people with respect and what have you over and above that if I am for example a doctor I will ensure that I am honest trustworthy hard-working I serve dedicatedly Muslim non-Muslim whoever it is even if you're a veterinary you could enter paradise through that do you want to hear the evidence people say what you mean I just look after dogs and I can enter heaven the answer is perhaps yes it could be if your intentions are right and you're doing it with the right reasons compassion being compassionate towards these animals it's something great and grand Listen, I'm not encouraging it. I'm actually just saying it's permissible. That's all. I don't want people to give up medicine and say, right, we're becoming vets now. <laughs> because if you take a look at the hadith, it's the third time I'm mentioning it in this season of my presence in Cape Town of the woman who entered Jannah because she quenched the thirst of a dog. What happened? She wasn't even a vet. A vet has spent a lot of time. And when they go, you know, to an ailing dog that is perhaps dying, and they, for example, administer some medication or whatever it be to that particular dog and the dog is doing well and you can bark properly, you know, rah, rah, you know, what would happen? Subhanallah. You weren't expecting that, were you, mashallah? You know, I was just telling the uncle here that, you know, when we, got a, when we got a talk for youth and the university students, I enjoy it because I can just be myself. The minute you see old people with white gray hairs here, you know, you got to, I couldn't do what I just did. did I? <laughs> but the point is you get happy because the dog is once again on his feet, walking around, wagging its tail, whatever, and it's gone. So if Jannah and paradise was achieved by... If Jannah and paradise was achieved by the quenching of the thirst of the dog, what if something more dedicated is provided for that dog? Don't you think there's a greater chance of getting Jannah? Common sense. Subhanallah. We ask Allah to open our doors. So let's be hopeful. Let's try. Let's use our field to reach out to people. Let's become better. And let's remember that sometimes because of our haughtiness and arrogance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that it's best for us not to get exactly what we want and it brings me to one very interesting point none of us not a single one of us will have everything we want on earth every time no not one because we were not sent to the earth in order to have whatever we want there's a special place known as paradise where that will come if we had whatever we wanted on earth what was the point of going to a place called heaven? Where Allah says, you get whatever you want. You say, well, I've already got whatever I want. There was no point. So Allah says, you coming here, we will just test you. Because if you watch carefully, some of you will pass away early. Some pass away a little bit later. Some live a long, long life. And then they pass away. Everyone passes away. Where are they going? Why is it that they were here so short? They're going somewhere. I was talking a few days ago to someone a non-Muslim and they were speaking about death and how it is and I said you know what I believe that when we die and we see what we get later on we're going to tell ourselves hey I wasted too many years back there it was such a dump back there meaning back way here sorry for calling this place a dump <laughs> but to be honest you wouldn't know you have to have belief you're going to a better place you're a mu'min you've believed in Allah if he could give this to me, then definitely he's got something far better in store for me. If he's told me that, I believe it. Really. And so when I go there, I will be so delighted. Stop fearing so much that you get depressed. Hey, I'm getting old. I might die. I might die. You're not. You might die. You will die. And we're not saying that in a dooming way. We're saying it in a reality hitting way. Subhanallah. To say, look, just prepare. Just praise Allah. Wherever you faulted, ask Allah's forgiveness. Get back on the track and walk again in the right direction. 
Allah didn't say you won't falter. He knows your nature. He knows you personally. He knows your struggles. He hears you. He has a link with you. Remember this. That's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the teaching of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He made people feel the love of Allah. He made people feel the connection with Allah because he was connected with them and he made the people feel that he was one of them although he was far superior in the sense that he was the messenger of Allah the most noble of all prophets the highest of all creation but not once did he say you know what I'm better than all you guys here no the hadith says the Prophet وسلم, when he sat with people he sat like he was one of them amazing he sat like he was one of them he treated everyone with utmost respect. How many of us can do that to the others? I tell you one difficulty that we have in this ummah at the moment. We don't greet each other. No greeting whatsoever. No salam. Unless you know the person or you want something from them or perhaps they're wealthy or authority or popular or whatever else. Otherwise, there's no greeting. No, we have these faces that are all screwed up, literally. You know. Astaghfirullah. And what happens? You look at the other person, you look away and you're gone. But you're a Muslim, you're a Muslim. Learn to greet. I tell you, I've seen non-Muslims do better than us. Wallahi, I'm not joking. Good morning, sir. They will tell you as they pass you. Morning, ma'am. Good afternoon. They will tell you. Hi. How are you doing? Fine. You hear all these words, subhanAllah, coming from whom? Non-Muslims. They greet you. But you're a Muslim, you can't greet a fellow Muslim. You can't even greet others, no one. I'm just there, I'm my own person, dry, cold, that's it. It's me. Do you know that by greeting someone, you're actually engaging in a huge act of worship. You're achieving closeness to your maker because you share the same creator. Why do we call ourselves brothers and sisters? Because firstly, it's in humanity. We have the same creator. We have the same forefathers. And thereafter, if you still share the same faith, you've got even more in common. What we do today, we concentrate on the differences. That's all. I've got 50 million issues in common. Five differences. You're my enemy. That's it. That's it. This is not the teaching of Muhammad sallallahu He sees the opportunity to look into all his companions. He used them for what they were keen in. Some of them could read and write. He used to call them and tell them, write down this revelation on some occasions. Some of them were experts, for example, in learning. He told them, come here. I want you to learn this language and that language. I want you to do this and that. They learned, they memorized. Some of them were experts, for example, in sewing or in uh, carpentry. He told them, come, we'd like a mimbar. And they made a mimbar. You know, mimbar, the pulpit of Muhammad Wasallam. It was made by a carpenter, the experts. They were all experts. Some of them were business people, top businessmen. And he acknowledged it. And then he went out and said, You know, a, a, a businessman who is honest and trustworthy will be resurrected with the messengers and the pious and the martyrs on the day of judgment. Wow. And what were you doing? Business. That's it. I was a businessman, but I was honest. So from this, we learn whatever your field is, no problem. Study it, develop in it. You know, the sky is not even the limit. It's beyond the skies. But be a good Muslim. There must be a turning point in your life. You have to turn. You have to come close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's goodness and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open our doors. Aqulu ma tasma'oon wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil